Testing. <clears throat> me, 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 so why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, all right. So we got another paper today to close out the week. We got a paper here called Textbooks Are All You Need. This is uh, coming from Microsoft Research, which is, I guess, OpenAI now. I think this... Whenever you see Microsoft Research versus OpenAI, it's probably the original Microsoft AI research team, which is separate from the OpenAI research team. There's probably a bit of separation between those, similar to kind of whenever Google initially acquired DeepMind for a period of probably five years, DeepMind was separate from Google Brain, right? Because there's, after any kind of acquisition, it takes time to integrate those people. So I imagine there's kind of a similar situation in Microsoft where even though they acquired OpenAI and those are technically the same companies now, there's probably a little bit of a separation there. Maybe it's because they didn't even actually acquire them. I think they, they just invested in them, but it might still be separate entities. So anyways, this is the Microsoft research team. This paper came out uh, 20 June 2023, so just a couple days ago. Uh, we introduce Phi 1, a new language model for code. Okay, so we got a language model specifically on code with significantly smaller size than competing models. Okay, smaller. So we'll see what smaller means in this context. Uh, transformer based. So transformers are the uh, kind of architecture du jour, which means the architecture that is popular. Uh, with 1.3 billion parameters. So this is pretty small. Um, uh, model sizes uh, hugging face leaderboard. So there's a leaderboard. Uh, open LLM leaderboard. I think it might be this one. Uh, yeah, here you go. So these are different. There's, there's these leaderboards now where people basically post the different language models and the scores that they get on different benchmarks. Unfortunately, these benchmarks are not necessarily great, so there's still kind of an open question about how you evaluate these models, but what I'm going for here is just to show you uh, the different sizes here. So right here we got Falcon 40B, which is a open source model created by the uh, Saudi Arabian or funded by the Saudi Arabian government. But 40 billion parameters, you got, of course, the Llama, 65 billion parameters, Guanaco is based on Llama, 30 billion, 40 billion, 30 billion, 30 billion. So you're gonna kinda get an idea of the number of parameters here. So 1.3 billion parameters is significantly smaller than that. Uh, train for four days on eight A100s, so that's not a lot of time, and eight A100s, this is just one server rack, so. That's relatively cheap. You know, we're talking about maybe tens of thousands of dollars rather than hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars for training. Using a selection of textbook quality data from the web. Six billion tokens. Okay. Uh, and synthetically generated textbooks. Okay, so we're talking about synthetic data here, right? This is something that I've kind of uh, tried to do before. I had a co-founded a synthetic data startup, but not in this space. So this is uh, language synthetic data, text-based synthetic data. My experience is with uh, visual synthetic data, so images. Uh, okay, and exercises with GPT-3. So it seems like they generated a data set with GPT-3 of 1 billion tokens, and that's their synthetic data set. And then they have a kind of a cleaned curated data set that is about 6 billion tokens. We got about 7 billion tokens total, it seems. 
Uh, despite this small scale, Phi Wan attains pass at one accuracy of 50% on human eval. So I think the way that this uh, pass at one accuracy metric works is that you have to get it right on the first time. I think that's what the at one means. So they're basically like questions and you have to get them right. Uh, 50%, 55%, I don't really know much about these benchmarks. These are other benchmarks here, human eval, and uh, let's put the little benchmark, and then MBPP, I don't really know. I'm gonna be honest with you guys, I'm not like an NLP guy, so I don't really know these NLP benchmarks too much. Uh, maybe they're even here. MMLU, is that the same as MMBP? No, it's probably a different one. Uh, what about extended? Is there, can I find other scores here? Uh, like if I go here. Uh, open LLM leaderboard, is this, this is what I was looking at? Yeah, okay, so I guess they don't have the benchmarks that are here. And this is part of the problem is with these uh, models is that here they're giving you accuracy scores on these benchmarks, human eval and MBPP, and then if you go on the open LLM leaderboard, it, those, those aren't even the same benchmarks, so <laughs> you can't even compare to these ones. Too many benchmarks, and all of them kind of suck, unfortunately. Uh, our model before fine-tuning on a data set of coding exercises. Okay, so they're doing uh, some kind of pre-training and then fine-tuning. So the, the one that's uh, only pre-trained is called base, and then the one that they uh, fine-tune is called small. And the smaller one actually only has 350 million parameters, so kind of a little bit smaller than the uh, base model. Trained with the same pipeline, it still achieves 45%. Okay. The art of training large artificial neural networks has made extraordinary progress, especially after the discovery of the transformer architecture. Uh, is it really the transformer or is it the GPUs? I think most people would say, especially someone like Rich Sutton, that it's not the transformer, it's the GPUs. It's the fact that our compute has kind of exploded. Yet the science behind this success remains limited amid vast and confusing array of results. Little pun on words there because Ten, or neural networks are basically just these giant arrays, or aka tensors, which is just an array in higher dimensional space. A semblance of order emerged around the same times were introduced, namely that performance improves somewhat predictably as one scales up either at the amount of compute or the size of the network. Uh, I don't know about the same time as transformers were introduced. I feel like you could have asked people in like the 90s and they would have told you that this is the case where you can make the model bigger and the data set bigger and it would increase performance. So we've known about this power law for a long time, uh, a phenomenon which is now referred to as scaling laws. The subsequent explanation of scale in deep learning was guided by these scaling laws and discovered discoveries of variance of these laws led to rapid jump in performance. In this work, we're following the footsteps of 23. We explore the improvement that can be obtained by the quality of the data. Uh, it has long been known that higher quality data leads to better results. Data cleaning is an important part of the data set creation. Yeah, and then anybody who's kind of done machine learning in the real world or any kind of data science knows that unfortunately the reality is that you're going to spend 80% of your time just going through your data set and cleaning it. Uh, and it can yield to other side benefits, such as somewhat smaller data sets. Uh, this was kind of a whole field for a while, this kind of idea of data set distillation. The recent work of Eldon and Lee on Tiny Stories, a high quality data set synthetically generated to teach English to neural networks, showed that in fact the effect of high quality data extends well past this. Improving data quality can dramatically change the shape of those scaling laws potentially allowing to match the performance of large-scale models with much leaner training and models. Yeah, there's just so many things here. You know, obviously I have a ton of opinions because I've like kind of worked in the synthetic data space and I've been kind of part of this machine learning evolution over the years. So I kind of have opinions that have been shaped, but I feel like one way to think about it is that much like when you teach a human child, you have to base the, the choice of the curriculum matters. I think the same thing matters for these neural nets where it's like exactly what type of information you're training on and at what time and kind of having this curriculum that slowly builds up in complexity, I think is important. And I feel like 
reinforcement learning kind of got this and there was a lot of work that I've seen where people basically train on one set of limited tasks and then they train on a slightly more complicated set of tasks and then they train on an even more complicated set of tasks, right? They have this kind of curriculum that slowly builds up the complexity as the policy or the neural net gets better. But people don't really do that for uh, kind of pre-training these giant uh, natural language models. But I feel like they could, right? I can envision a world 10 years from now where basically in order to train an LLM, you have these series of what they're calling here textbooks, right, in this paper that kind of slowly increase in complexity and allow you to train a model much faster, much more efficiently, and also kind of more end up with a model that has some specific desired kind of uh, compression of human knowledge. Uh, okay, show that high quality data can improve the state of the art of lang large language models while dramatically reducing the data set size and training compute. Importantly, smaller models requiring less training can significantly reduce environmental cost. This is such a bogus argument. I'm like really against this like LLM training is leading to climate change. Like I think that's just this, such a bogus argument for um, not training LLMs, you know? There's so many other things that we do as a human species that are way worse for the environment than training LLMs, you know? So we focus our attention on LLMs trained for code and specifically writing simple Python functions from their doc strings. Okay, so they're gonna be kind of limiting to specifically the code task and then uh, writing simple Python functions from their doc string. So what they're referring to here is that uh, Am I going to pull up a code editor? Yeah, why don't I do that? Let's open up a little VS Code. But uh, let's do a new file. Let's do a Python file. So if I was to make a function here and I was going to say add two numbers, right? Let me make this a little bit bigger. Uh, let's say I do this, right? A doc string is this. So add two, get two numbers together and return the sum. So a doc string is basically a string, right? Which is just like a sentence or a bunch of sentences. It can be multiple lines. You can have things here and whatever, right? And the whole point of a doc string is it's so other humans can understand what this function is about, right? So the whole point of doc strings is documentation. It's a documentation string. And there's basically, you can see here, this is GitHub Copilot deciding that, okay, given this name of the function, given the inputs here, X and Y, and then given this doc string, what am I gonna do here? So let's say, for example, we said uh, subtract two numbers. You see, look at that. So once we put the word subtract in there, uh, GitHub Copilot has decided to subtract those. But what's interesting here is that the doc string actually says add two numbers and return the sum. So in this case, GitHub Copilot is ignoring the doc string and deciding uh, to use the name of the function as uh, as the correct uh, way to, to basically autocomplete this, which is kind of interesting to think about, right? So there's some relative importance in uh, Copilot's mind that comments are less important than the name of the function. But that's what they're talking about here where they're writing simple Python functions from their doc strings. Uh, okay, the evaluation benchmark proposed in the latter work, human eval, has been widely adopted for comparing LLM's performance on code. Okay, so it seems like this benchmark that we were looking at earlier, human eval, is uh, basically some kind of code benchmark. We demonstrate the power of high quality data in breaking existing scaling laws by a, training a 1.3 billion parameter model uh, for roughly eight passes over seven billion tokens. So eight passes over seven billion tokens, sometimes passes like this is called epochs. So eight epochs of seven billion tokens it basically just means you trained uh, the entire data set and then you train the entire data set again and then you train the entire data set again, you do that eight times. Uh, but that's eight is actually a very small number. You can see hundreds of epochs, thousands of epochs, especially if your data set is small and you're using data augmentation. Uh, followed by fine-tuning on less than 200 million tokens. We pre-train on textbook quality data, both synthetically generated and filtered from web sources. Okay, so they're also generating, synthetically generating the textbook data as well. 
Uh, we fine-tune the textbook exercise like data. Despite being several orders of magnitude smaller than competing models, both in terms of data set and model size, we attain 50.6% accuracy and 55 accuracy. Uh, so actually MBPP stands for Mostly Basic Python Programs. And one of the best self-reported numbers using one LLM generation. We discuss evidence for the importance of our data selection process in achieving this result, despite being trained on much fewer tokens. Uh, I feel like they could have picked a better name, right? Like Phi1 just doesn't sound as cool. They could have picked like, I feel like you have to pick a name that's like an animal, you know, like uh, Toad or Guanaco or Llama, you know what I'm saying? Like Falcon. Pick some catchy animal name. Call it Aardvark, you know? Platypus, you know? I feel like Phi1, nobody's going to remember it just because that name is just so forgettable. In section three, we discuss emergent properties. Uh, comparing the outputs of Phi 1, but with only 350 million parameters, uh, the methodology is reminiscent of the sparks of AGI. This is another pretty cool paper um, where they basically analyze. I think this came out like right when ChatGPT was like uh, super popular and just started to come out, where basically they realized that these LLMs have the ability to do theory of mind, which means they can kind of effectively be conscious. You know, people don't want to say that they're conscious, but I'm comfortable saying that. <clears throat> I think these LLMs are totally conscious. Uh, moving away, finally in section four, we discuss alternative benchmarks and blah, blah, blah. Okay. More related works. Uh, our work is part of the recent program of using LLMs for program synthesis. Program synthesis here is uh, just writing code. Uh, part of the emerging trend of using LLMs to synthesize data for the training of new generations of LLMs. Yeah, I think this is a huge trend. Obviously, I I uh, was bought in enough to this trend that I made a whole startup, but I feel like anytime you're training a neural net, what you're really doing is compressing the training data. Like the neural net itself is really just a compressed form of the data that it's been trained on. So... The size of the data set is important, right? You want the distribution of data. If you think of your whole training data set as a distribution, you want the variance of that to be very big, right? You want a lot of different things to be training on. But I also think that the the kind of the mean, the bias of that distribution, where is that distribution actually in this kind of giant infinite dimensional data set distribution space? And I feel like synthetically uh, generated data gives you the ability to control where you're putting that training distribution, which ultimately gives you the ability to control uh, the behavior of an LLM. So it's all about control, right? Which is another way to f think about the alignment. Uh, whether such recursive training much lead to narrower scope. Note that this paper, we focus on the narrow task, in which case it seems plausible to attain better performance than the teacher uh, LLM on that specific task. Uh, training details and the importance of high-quality data. Okay, so here they have uh, on the y-axis pass at one accuracy on human eval. So roughly the higher the number, the better, right? So this is some kind of accuracy number here. Uh, they have three different models here. They have a small model, 350 million parameters, trained on 26 billion tokens. Here they have the same size model, 350 million parameters, now trained on basically four times the amount of tokens, so 76 billion tokens. And here they have uh, a bigger model, 1.3 billion, so roughly four times the size of this model. And it's only trained on kind of somewhere in between. So not uh, somewhere in between 26 billion and 70, 76 billion is 51 billion tokens. So you can actually see here uh, the stack. The stack is a uh, giant uh, data set that people train on. And there's actually a, a website uh, called The Stack. Are you in The Stack? You in the stack. I posted this before. Uh, here, hugging face. Are you in the stack? Yeah, am I in the stack? So, this was a giant scrape uh, that they did of the uh, the stack, which is a six terabyte data set of open source code. And if you actually you can put your GitHub username in here, and they can they'll tell you if you're in it. So. I think I was in one of them, but let me make sure. Who po? Am I in the stack? Who po? Check. Yes. Mini sweeps and sweeps are in the stack. So 
this is a little bit fun, but you can go and that means that just a very small little part of you is uh, inside all of these LLMs. Uh, the groupings corresponds to the usual scaling, so okay. Never mind, we we're still looking at this. We got code textbook, code textbook, and code exercises. So obviously we got a huge discrepancy here between only the stack, the stack plus code textbook, and the stack plus code textbook and code exercises. So the code textbook is probably going to be the uh, synthetically generated data set in this uh, paper. But you can see how much of a difference it makes. And the improvement isn't limited to small models. It's basically, it works with the big models and it doesn't seem to be dependent on the number of tokens either. Right, so you see the same kind of like scaling behavior no matter what. Uh, okay, each column corresponds to different training data sets. The first orange column represents the performance trained on the standard data set of deduplicated Python files from the stack. Okay, uh, plus stack overflow for 1.3 billion parameter model. The second light green column represents the performance of models trained on our new data set, uh, code textbook. And the third one corresponds to the second column fine tuned on our new code exercises data set. Okay, so they're basically, in this paper, it sounds like what they're going to do is they're going to have a pre-training uh, synthetic data set called Code Textbook, and then they're going to have a fine-tuning synthetic data set called Code Exercises. Even without any fine-tuning, our phi one based model trained on Code Textbooks achieves 29% performance with a mere 1.3 billion parameters. Uh, on top of this, fine-tuning on our Code Exercises data set not only gives us top performance, but also unlocks further unexpected coding capabilities. Okay, so some kind of emergent ability here, right? Whenever you train a model to do something and then it happens to be good at something else, that's called an emergent ability. And this is something that LLMs are very, very, uh, seem to ha happen all the time, right? So you'll train an LLM on code and it'll end up being better at uh, reasoning in some other task, you know? Uh, the central ingredient relies on textbook quality training data. Unlike previous work that used standard sources of text data, blah, 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 other web-based data sets, we argue that these sources are not optimal for teaching the model how to plan and reason. On the other hand, our model, architect model architecture and training methods are fairly conventional. Okay, so they're not really going to try to do anything tricky here with the architecture and training methods, which I think is a potentially, uh, they're leaving something on the table because I think the training method, I think there's something to curriculum. I think that people haven't really explored the, people are still in this kind of like pre-training and then fine tuning, this kind of like two stage, but I think you could probably have way more stages. I think you could have multiple pre-training stages uh, that have slightly different uh, data sets, but people aren't, uh, that's still a little bit away. I think people are still on this pre-training and then fine tuning. Uh, paradigm. Uh, we devote this section primarily primarily to explaining how we curated our data. The standard code data sets form a large and diverse corpus covering broad range of topics and use cases. Based on manual inspection, we observe that many of these snippets are not very instruct instructive for learning the basics of coding. Yeah, and this is kind of kind of the whole point, right? It's like, why why do you uh, spend a bunch of time cleaning your data as a data scientist or a machine learning engineer? The reason you do that is because it's not necessarily that you're going to find a typo and then you're going to fix that typo and, you're, and your model's going to perform better because there's no typos in the data. It's because you, you're going to start learning more about the data. And it seems like basically they sat there and they started going through these examples in the stack and they were like, hey, half of these examples aren't very good. They're either poorly written or like it's a function that doesn't mean anything or something's going on, right? So there's always a ton of effort to be gained in manually inspecting your data set and actually trying to think about whether it's what you're looking at is actually going to help the model or if it's going to hurt the model. Many samples are not self-contained, mean they depend on other modules or files that are external to the snippet making them hard to understand without additional context. Okay, so you basically have a bunch of code maybe that looks like this, that's called like random API funk, and then it like return uh, random API funk two, right? And then the uh, uh, random 
org equals, right? So then imagine you're an LLM and you're sitting here and you're training on this exact text and you've read all of this and then you're you're basically getting asked, okay, what should I put here? There's literally no way the LLM is going to know what to put here, right? Because this this quark depends on whatever the fuck this random API function does, but it has no idea what that does. So it's just going to make a guess, right? Maybe random value. So that's kind of what they're saying there. It's like, if you don't have the additional context, you can't expect the LLM to be able to complete that text. And because these LLMs are basically in the pre-training phase, they're, they're doing this kind of next token prediction. You need to be able to give them uh, examples where they can reasonably actually predict the next token. Uh, typical examples do not improve any meaningful, involve any meaningful computation. Uh, did you see uh, Nisio? First of all, hello Nisio. Good morning to you. Uh, your question: Did you hear the leak about GPT-4 being a mixture of eight experts, most likely trained on highly specific paper data sets like this papers? Uh, yes, we did see that. I talked about it uh, in yesterday's stream, and I posted some stuff about it on the Discord. Um, I think it was important, you know, I think that it kind of revealed that there isn't anything secret that GPT or that OpenAI is doing, that basically what they're doing is a mixture of experts, which is a technique that people have been doing in uh, Kaggle competitions for a very long time. But it's unusual because the problem with mixture of experts is that you're you're spending a lot on inference, right? It's like if you just have one model and you use that one model, you're going to get an answer. If you have eight models, you're going to get a better answer, but is it really worth eight times the amount of compute? Generally not, right? So generally people aren't going to use a mixture of experts because it's just 10 times the amount of money on your inference cost. So it, people just, even though people were aware of this technique, people didn't think that GP, or that OpenAI would be using it because why would they make uh, their inference budget 10 times more expensive? But what they didn't understand is the mentality of people like Sam Allman, right? Like Sam Allman is a VC. And when you're doing uh, VC startups, these people have a completely different mentality and they're totally fine burning $100 to get one user, right? Like they're totally fine burning money to get users on their app or platform or whatever it is. So as an engineer, it doesn't make any sense to burn a bunch of money by having a mixture of experts. But if you're a VC and you're just trying to get a bunch of users, which is the type of mentality they had with ChatGPT, it actually makes a ton of sense. Hey, it costs us 10 times more to do inference than everybody else because we're using eight models instead of just one model. But if using those eight models makes you a little bit extra performant and that gets you the user, then it's totally worth it. So I don't know. That's my opinion on that. But I think that we'll see more and more companies kind of do this mixture of experts approach. So uh, Bard and the other uh, competitors to OpenAI models will basically see a bump in performance because they will start using a mixture of experts as well. Uh, okay, back to the paper here. Samples that do contain algorithmic logic are often buried inside complex or poorly documented functions, making them difficult to follow or learn from. <laughs> this is like anybody who's worked in a large uh, code base as a software engineer knows how annoying <laughs> it can get and how complicated and poorly documented these code bases can get. So kind of makes sense that they're also shitty for LLMs. Uh, the examples are skewed towards certain topics or use cases, resulting in an unbalanced distribution of coding concepts and skills. Yeah, this is also another big problem. A lot of these uh, data sets, uh, for example, are coding challenge data sets. So most big tech companies, the way that they hire people is they basically cr uh, created this like coding, uh, coding problems, sometimes also called leak code. Uh, problems, right? Where it's basically these little, like, toy little problems that you can solve in 30 minutes within the kind of time of an interview. And the problem is that these little coding problems don't really reflect what you actually have to do when you code in a production environment to actually create products, right? They're designed around kind of trying to be a little bit challenging and, and to be, it's kind of like the problem with SAT uh, tests where like SAT tests aren't really a measure of intelligence. They're a measure of how good you are at 
kind of memorizing things and code code challenges are similar to that so unfortunately there's a lot more code challenge uh examples than there are uh code that actually represents an actual useful thing that is doing something in the real world so there's this kind of bias towards uh being very good at these coding challenges as opposed to being good at uh writing code that's actually going to do something in the real world so that bias is the result of just the distribution of the data. Um, what can imagine how frustrating and inefficient it would be for a human learner to try to acquire coding skills from these data sets? Well, we don't need to imagine it. We already know how frustrating and inefficient it is. Anybody who's done a bunch of leak code question, leak code problems, they know this firsthand. You know, you're just sitting there, you're just doing problem after problem after problem, and in your head you're saying, dude, why do I need to learn this stuff? This is so useless. So uh, we don't need to imagine it. We've experienced it. Uh, we hypothesize that these issues also affect the performance of language models as they reduce the quality and the quality quantity of the signal that maps natural language to code. Yep, agree with that. We conjecture that language models would benefit from a training set that has the same qualities as what a human would perceive as a good textbook. Also agree. It should be clear, self-contained, instructive, and balanced. In this work, we address this challenge directly and show that by intentionally selecting and generating high quality data, we can achieve state-of-the-art results on code generation tasks. And a much smaller model and less compute. I mean, this is big, you know? I like everything that they're saying in this paper. So they have a filtered code language data set, which is a subset of the stack and stack overflow. Uh, they have the synthetic textbook data set, which is less than 1 billion tokens generated by GPT 3.5. And then they have small synthetic exercises data set. So this is the uh, pre-training data set, and then this is going to be the fine-tuning data set. Uh, we describe those data sets in more detail. Taken together, the above data sets contain less than 70 billion, 7 billion tokens. Uh, we can refer to the combination of filtered code language and synthetic textbook data set as code textbook and use it in the pre-training phase to get the base model, phi1 base. And then they fine tune that model on the synthetic exercises, AKA the code exercises and get the phi1 model. Okay, blah, 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 unlocks many emergent capabilities. Filtering of existing code data sets using a transformer based classifier. Okay, so a classifier is a model that classifies. So you can have classification into any number of categories. Kind of the most famous example is classifying an image as a dog or a cat. But I think here what they're going to be doing is they're going to have a uh, model that classifies as to whether or not a specific uh, file or a specific section of the training data set is good or not. We use a Python subset of the deduplicated version of the stack and stack overflow, which together contains 35 million files and samples. We annotate the quality of a small subset of these. Okay, so annotate means a human is going in and saying, okay, this is good, this is bad, this is good, this is bad, this is medium, this is good, right? And then once you annotate 100K of those, you can then train a model on that and then use that model to annotate the rest of the data set. Uh, the model is prompted to determine its educational value for a student whose goal is to learn basic con coding concepts. So this is kind of even weird. It's like, actually, they're not even annotating with a human. They're annotating with GPT-4. So already the annotation is being done synthetically. We then use this annotated data set to train a random force classifier. This is actually kind of an old school uh, machine learning technique. This isn't even deep learning based. This is a... Uh, and older than that, uh, that predicts the quality of a file and sample using its output embedding from a pre-trained cogen model as features. So they're taking some pre-trained cogen model, they're taking the very last layer, right? The, the very last layer is also called the embedding. You can think of it as a feature, right? It's a representation of whatever the uh, input is. And they're using that vector which to a human doesn't look like anything it just looks like a bunch of numbers and they're using that to train a random force classifier based on uh this uh quality annotation 
Uh, we use GPT-4 minimally only for annotations. We thus view our usage of GPT-4 as merely a way to avoid tedious human annotation efforts. Yeah, human annotation is not particularly great. You know, usually it's done with uh, kind of low cost of living people in like third world countries. I think OpenAI mentioned that they uh, do this in Nigeria. I think uh, ScaleAI does this in the Philippines. So it's a little bit sketchy, you know, it kind of feels like the early days of globalization whenever people were uh, manufacturing things in uh, China and uh, Japan, and it's, it feels a little slimy, you know, outsourcing uh, low value add tasks to humans just feels kind of slimy to me. Educational values determined by the filter. Okay, so here we have two different Python codes here. Uh, Import torch, import red, this is regex. Low educational value, high educational value. Okay, so high educational value. Why is this high educational value? Because the name of this function, normalize, tells you exactly what this function does. It's uh, It has a doc string, right? So this doc string lets me know exactly what this function does. And I can basically see everything here, right? There's no extra weird quarks. This doesn't call any external functions that I don't know what they do. It's a very clear little contained function. And I basically can learn everything I need to know from here, right? Compare it to this, right? If you look at this, what is Vim? What is Dnight, right? Like what is a sync parent? Like, I don't know what any of these things are, right? Because these are defined in some other file, right? This is a just a little chunk of probably a very large code base that has a bunch of abstractions that I don't know what they are, like user context, right? So what is win with, right? Uh, so it kind of makes sense that trying to learn from this type of code, you're not gonna learn anything, but trying to learn from this kind of code, you're gonna learn a lot more, right? So if I were a human uh, and I were trying to teach another human how to code, I would agree that this over here is going to be much higher educational value than this over here. Uh, so now the question that this data or that this paper is asking is, okay, does that also apply to uh, LLMs? And it does. Uh, one of the main challenges in creating a high quality data set is ensuring that the examples are diverse and non-repetitive. I think the non-repetitive isn't as important, but the diversity is key. Uh, by diversity, we mean that the example should cover a wide range of coding concepts, skills, and scenarios, and that they should vary in their level of difficulty, complexity, and style. Diversity is important for several reasons. It exposes the language model to different ways of expressing and solving problems in code. It reduces the risk of overfitting or memorizing specific patterns or solutions. And it increases the generalization and robustness of the model to unseen or novel tasks. Uh, however, achieving diversity is not trivial, especially when using synthetic data generated by another language model. Yeah, so anytime you're generating synthetic data, you're usually doing it with some kind of heuristic, right? And that heuristic can result in very repetitive and kind of narrow data, right? So one of the biggest problems with synthetic data generation is that the data set that you generate has a very low variance, means that it's very kind of like tall and narrow, right? And whenever I'm talking about tall and narrow, I'm thinking about a Gaussian distribution, right? Ideally, you want your distribution of data to be kind of like, uh, more like this orange line, right? Very wide, lots of different things, and it covers the entire space of data. But generating a very wide distribution synthetically is difficult. You, always, you kind of tend to end up generating these distributions that are very narrow and limited. So, uh, diversity is not trivial. Achieving diversity is not trivial. Uh, simply prompting the model to produce a coding textbook, even with some variation, will likely result in a very homogeneous and redundant data set, where the same concepts and solutions are repeated over and over with minor changes. This is because language models tend to follow the most probable or common paths given their training data and their priors. Right? Language models are just outputting a probability distribution over all tokens, so generally the same things are going to be high probability tokens every time. They lack the creativity or the incentive to explore alternative or model ways of generating code. I don't think they lack it. I just think we need to get better at elucidating it from these models. One needs to find the right trick that will induce the language model to be more creative and diverse with its output while still maintaining the quality and coherence of the examples. Yeah, and I think this is another big 
uh, point that they're kind of sidestepping here, but the nice thing about code is that you can generate code and then you can ev you can test that code. You can run that code and see if it actually works, right? So that makes uh, synthetic generation of code data sets actually easier because I can run this and if I try to run this, it's going to create an error, right? So we have a way of testing whether the data, whether the individual examples are coherent and they actually run, but that's not the case with other synthetically generated data set, right? Other synthetically generated data, you might have to literally go through it manually to make sure that it's actually correct. A uh, diverse set of short stories was created by including a random sh subset of short words requiring that they somehow be combined in the generated text. We look for ways to inject randomness in the prompt in a way that gives rise to the generation of a diverse data set. Is the data set 100% code? I would have thought a lot of coding patterns would have benefited from some general world knowledge. Surprising. Yeah, I mean, I think it's actually the opposite way. I think that one of the more interesting things to me is that training on code makes LLMs better at logic, but not just like code logic, but like every kind of logic, right? So like, it's interesting that if you want to make a really good uh, lawyer LLM, pre-training it on code actually makes it a better lawyer, right? Pre-training uh, on code makes it a better doctor. So there's something about code in that code is kind of like the best way to represent logic with language. So I feel like code is a very strong prior for logic and kind of this kind of like Turing machine based reasoning. Uh, the data set consists of less than 1 billion tokens uh, in generated Python textbooks synthesized to provide high quality source of natural language heavy text interleaved with relevant code snippets. So maybe Nisio, here's the answer to your question is that the it's heavily documented. So it is code, but they're gonna. It's gonna have a bunch of comments like this. Maybe, maybe instead of just compute cosine distance, it has like a whole paragraph here. We don't know exactly what they mean by heavy text interleaved with relevant code snippets. Uh, we targeted the content of these textbooks to cover topics that promote reasoning and basic algorithmic skills. Diversity is abstained by providing constraints on topics and target audience of the generated textbook. Okay, so this is how they're generating the, the actual things. They're using uh, GPT 3.5 to generate this, by the way. So uh, to begin, let us define singular and non-singular matrices. A matrix is said to be singular, blah, blah, blah. So they give it a little bit of background on matrices, and then they give it the example. So consider the matrix, blah, blah, blah. We can check out this matrix using the is singular function. And then here you go in import numpy and then here's your function there's no doc string here but i guess they have this extra piece of chunk of text here and actually this is interesting too here where they have a print statement but in if you just scraped a bunch of code you probably wouldn't get this right this is a comment that's telling you what the output of this print is going to be most code that you look at is not going to out is not going to have the output of the code as a comment right next to it right but adding the output of the code as a comment right next to the print statement is actually very useful if you're trying to learn from this code so it's like these little details like this that that matter when you're actually thinking about code quality let me take a little sip of some water here I ran out of yerba mate, so I'm not as heavily caffeinated as I am normally. Uh, this small synthetic exercises data set, so this is the uh, fine-tuning synthetic data set, consists of less than 100 million tokens of Python exercises. Each exercise is a doc string of a function that needs to be completed. The goal of this data set is to align the model to perform function completion tasks based on natural language instructions. This data set was also generated by 3.5, where the main means of eliciting diversity is by constraining the function names. That's kind of a weird way to get diversity. Uh, for this data set in particular, we conduct explicit decontamination. <laughs> that just sounds weird. And alternative evaluations in the following sections. The following snippet illustrates a synthetically generated exercise. Okay, so here you have a synthetically generated little piece of code. Uh, 
it has a name for this function that kind of tells you. So if I was a human and I started reading this, like one thing you have to realize is that the LLMs are reading this token by token. So the LLM is reading this as def space valid underscore guessing underscore letters parentheses word. So it's reading this like token by token. So it's important that the name of the function kind of gives you information. If the name of this function is like something weird, then the LLM basically has no idea what this function does until it actually finishes the function. And, and at that point, you're not necessarily learning as much. So like the, the name of the function is important. I think it's more important than people think it is. Uh, and I think the types here is also important. So knowing that word is a string, right? Normally in Python, you don't have to do this. In Python, uh, I don't have to provide the type, right? So if I did random API function X and Y, uh, the LLM that is training on this is not going to know what X and Y are until it actually reads the function. But if I were to do something like this, right, and actually provide the type, now it knows that X is an int and Y is an int, right? And if I provide the output type as well, now it also knows what the output is, right? So in Python, this thing is, this is what the function will return. This is the type of the function that will return. So most uh, big boy programming languages have types. They're kind of enforced explicitly, but Python does not. Although recently, basically, uh, all these all this typing like this is actually just a recent addition to Python, and I think it's made Python a lot better. And it's actually made Python a lot better for LLM-based training too. So kind of interesting how that worked out. Uh, okay, model architecture and training. Uh, we use a decoder only transformer model. Uh, okay, so let's pull up the attention is all you need, which by the way, attention is all you need is the uh, original transformer paper. And uh, the name of this entire paper here, textbooks are all you need is a is a pun on that, right? So there's a lot of papers that are called blank are all you need. And really what that is, is they're trying to be funny. They're trying to reference this paper, which is called attention is all you need. So that's what the all you need means. There's no kind of like f weird formal scientific definition for this. It's just, they're just trying to be clever with the name and basically make a pun on the original uh, transformer paper, which is called attention is all you need. Okay. But the reason I pulled this up is to talk about encoders and decoders. So the original transformer paper is used for translating. So it was basically used to translate a sentence in uh, one language to a different language. And the way that it did that is it would encode the sentence in one language and then use that in a cross attention way with the uh, sentence in the other language, right? So you have this part here, which is the encoder. And then you have this part here, which is the decoder. So uh, here, what they're saying If we scroll back down to where we were is that they're using only the decoder they're not encoding anything right so only the decoder and the decoder is important because the decoder uh the encoder here has a uh here this is a self-attention block right so it pays attention to its all of itself but this here is a masked self-attention and why is it masked the reason it's masked is because uh the output is coming in one token at a time so you're basically masking it such that it can't look in the future, right? So that's important to realize that the decoder is masked. Okay, and they're using flash attention, which is just basically um, one of many different solutions to the problem that transformers are very memory heavy. So flash attention is a way to get, uh, reduce the memory and compute footprint of a transformer. Uh, we also use MHA and MLP layers. These are the layers uh, here. So this feed forward here, this little blue brick, that's also called a fully connected neural network or a multi-layer perceptron, if you wanna be cool, MLP. Uh, GPT Neo X, the architecture uh, consists of 24 layers, hidden dimension of 2048. So 24 layers basically refers to how many of these bricks there are. You see how it says NX, so this is N times. So if you had uh, 24 layers, you're going to have 24 of these bricks on top of each other. So the output of this brick feeds into the next brick, and then the output of that brick feeds into the next brick, and then if the output of that brick feeds into the next brick, and so on. So 24 levels of that. Uh, 
the hidden dimension of 2048 refers to the width. So if you could imagine uh, this little feed forward uh, neural network here, right? It has some width, right? There's some total amount of parallelism in terms of the neurons that is happening there. So the width of that is called the uh, the hidden dimension, which is 2048. There's, there's multiple widths, right? This is a tensor. So a vector is two dimensional, then a matrix is more, and then you have a tensor. So a tensor basically represents uh, a chunk of data that has more than basically two, three, or four dimensions. So it's a little bit more complicated, but just think of this as the width. Uh, MLP inner dimension of 8192, 32 attention heads of dimension 64. Uh, the smaller 350 million parameter consists of 20 layers, less smaller hidden dimension, smaller MLP inner dimension, 16 attention heads, 32 or 64 dimension each. We use rotary position embedding. So these are also called ROPE. So if you ever see ROPE like that, rope, that's a rotary position embedding. And actually, I just posted uh, an interesting tweet about this uh, that I woke up to today where basically it turns out that position embeddings you can use right, let me not even go into that okay never mind if you're interested in that you can read uh, what I posted on the discord channel but I won't go into that because uh, we got we got stuff to do I've heard that the CS department at CM is very challenging did you find this to be true or was it easy for you what is CM Are you talking about CMU, Carnegie Mellon? So uh, my I did my undergrads and my master's at Carnegie Mellon, but my undergrad was in mechanical engineering and physics, and those are part of the uh, College of Engineering and College of Science. So I only was in the CS uh the only robotics, which robotics, which is what I did my master's in, so I was there for two years. That was inside the computer science class. And no, it was not easy. It was very hard. It was, you know, I feel like <laughs> it was definitely the type of thing where every single room that I was in, I felt like the stupidest person in the room. And, you know, I don't want to, this might sound racist, but it's not racist. But like, for example, in my computer vision class, I was like one of like three white kids. Everybody else was basic was Asian or South Asian. So... <laughs> It just kind of lets you know that like it's it's difficult like uh carnegie mellon cs like those people don't fuck around those people are very strong and at least when i was there doing my robotics masters i definitely felt like i was uh the dumbest person in the room many times but don't let that necessarily discourage you you know i think that if you're passionate and, and you're willing to put in the work and you're willing to kind of learn and you're willing to be wrong and, and sound stupid, I think that the sky's the limit and you can basically do anything. Uh, okay. Uh, flash attention, fill in the middle, multi-query attention. Okay, so a bunch of random extra tricks that they're putting in this model architecture. For both pre-training and fine-tuning, we concatenate our respective data sets into a single-dimensional array with end-of-text tokens separating the files. Okay, so there's these special tokens. So obviously, whenever you uh, give this to an LLM, it's not actually getting the individual in English letters. Basically, what's happening is this is getting tokenized. And tokens, you can think of it like little chunks of, of words, right? So maybe VAL would be a, a token, ID is a token. Generally, uh, any kind of special character, such as this colon, is going to be its own token. Um, and the way that LLMs know that it's the end of a particular example is usually there's a special token. So right after here, there's going to be basically this, uh, end of sequence token. And that's what they're referring to here. The end of text token. Uh, we train our models on sequence length of 2048. We use floating point 16. So, uh, we have a bunch of papers on this channel for all the different types of quantized, uh, training and quantization and there's a lot of cool stuff that people are doing with uh training in lower dimensional data types and uh quantizing these models into lower into lower uh smaller data types so floating point 16 and brain floating point 16 which is a variant of, of floating point 16 is 
currently the most popular way of training these models, but I would not be surprised if uh, over the next couple years we come up with ways of training these in even smaller. So maybe maybe some weird type of floating point eight, right? Like some maybe even like something even smaller than that, right? So, but right now floating point sixteen is kind of the state uh, the accepted way of training these accepted precision. Uh, linear warm up, linear decay, learning rate schedule, attention residual dropout. These are all just kind of standard machine learning tricks. Eight NVIDIA A100s. So this is a single server rack. The number eight is has a special significance. So wh what is the significance of the number eight is that most uh, server rack uh, have specifically eight. So when you see those big towers, right? Or not towers, um, server room, right? So if you guys are used to seeing like the images of this, right? So this is what a data center looks like. And these, uh, inside these basically shelvings, there's these racks. So you see this, this is, this is called one rack. And the way that these racks come, generally they have eight GPUs. So you see here's a perfect, so this is basically if you were to take this little uh, drawer right here, you could almost think of it, and you were to pull it out, it has exactly eight GPUs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So eight GPUs are what fit on one rack. So why is GPT-4 an ensemble of eight experts? Because it runs on one rack, right? Why did they use eight NVIDIA A100 GPUs here? because that's the exact size of one rack. So anytime you see that number eight, it's coming from this arbitrary uh, fact of existence that the number of GPUs that you can fit into whatever this is, which is probably exactly one foot or two foot or like some random measurement like that is exactly eight. So that's, if you ever see that eight, that's where that's coming from. Uh, I've heard some people are trying to get int eight fine tuning working. Yeah, there's. I've even seen some crazy stuff. I've seen uh, like uh, int three bit precision. Uh, I'm not gonna find it, but like people talking about three bits, you know. So I think there's there's gonna be some crazy stuff for sure in terms of lowering this sixteen here to eight, and then four, and then eventually three, and maybe even two. Uh, Fine-tuning to obtain Phi 1, use an additional 7 hours on the same hardware. Okay. Uh, Phi 1 base was trained on the code textbook data set. Uh, we effectively use a batch size of 1024. This is not a batch size that you can effectively do on your own computer. This is something you're only going to be able to get on a big uh, server rack like that. Uh, maximum learning rate of 1 e to the negative 3 with a warm-up. This is actually kind of a big learning rate, to be honest. Uh, weight decay of 0.1 and a total of 36,000 steps. So 36,000 steps at a batch size of 1024 is, uh, so steps here doesn't refer to an individual piece of data. It refers to uh, full steps, which basically means a batch of 1024. So 1024 times 36,000 is the total number of individual examples that the uh, Phi 1 base was trained on. Uh, we use the checkpoint at 24 steps as our Phi 1 base. This is equivalent to eight epochs. So what do they mean by checkpoint here? So generally when you're uh, training uh, machine learning models, you don't train it all the way to the end and then you basically save it at the final. You're basically intermediately saving the model at multiple points. And the reason you do this is because the, the training might actually make the model worse, right? Initially, the training is going to make it better, but then you get to a certain point where it starts to overfit and the training actually makes it worse. So you want to basically have a version of the model over time, right? A checkpoint at each different epoch usually, or maybe a certain number of steps. And then you can go and evaluate each of those checkpoints separately. And usually the one that's the best, the best checkpoint is generally not actually going to be the last one. It's going to be maybe two from the end or three from the end or something like that. Uh, okay, this is equivalent to eight epochs on our code textbook data set for a total of total of a little over 50 billion training tokens. Uh, despite the small size and computation, this model already achieves a 29% accuracy on human eval. Uh, I don't know how impressive this is. Maybe that's impressive. I don't know. Maybe one of you people that does a little bit more NLP stuff can let me know if that's, ac that's impressive or not. 
Uh, phi1 is obtained by fine-tuning phi1 base on code exercises data set. For fine-tuning, we use the same setup as pre-training, but different hyperparameters. We use an effective batch size of 256, maximum learning rate of 1e to the negative 4. Note how the learning rate here for fine-tuning is smaller than the learning rate for pre-training. If you were to use a bigger learning rate when you were fine-tuning, you would basically end up overriding all the progress that you made here in the training. So. Uh, weight decay of 0.01, obviously a smaller weight decay when you fine-tune than when you pre-train. Uh, we train for a total of 6,000 steps and pick the best checkpoint. So they save a checkpoint every 1,000 steps here. Uh, spikes of model capacity after fine-tuning on, or capability after fine-tuning on code exercises. So this is sometimes called emergent behavior when your the capability of your model will spike randomly, right? It's almost like the it clicks. It, it's kind of like when you're trying to learn something and it doesn't. You can't get it. You can't get it. You can't get it. Then you read one sentence and suddenly it makes sense. And suddenly it's like it clicks in your head, and now suddenly you understand it. LLMs have the same kind of situation where they they're dealing with a specific way to think about things, and then they'll they'll get to a certain point, some kind of critical example or some kind of batch that happens to push it in right the, the right direction, and then it kind of clicks and it falls into a new local minima. And that local minima is better in terms of capability than the local minima that it was in before. Uh, okay, code exercises consist exclusively of short Python tasks. We demonstrate that quite remarkably, the model after fine tuning also exhibits a substantial improvement in executing tasks that are not featured in the fine tuning data set, right? So, this kind of emergent uh, generalization outside of the original uh, pre trained task. This includes managing intricate algorithmic tasks and using external libraries. Uh, this suggests that our fine-tuning process might have helped the model in reorganizing and consolidating the knowledge acquired during pre-training, even if such knowledge was not explicitly present in our code exercises dataset. Uh, fine-tuning improves the model's understanding. Uh, using a simple Python function that we created ourselves, we observed below that the model shows a much higher level of understanding and compliance after fine-tuning. Uh, struggles with logical relationships, can interpret the question and generally answer, generate the answer correctly. Okay, so here you have, I guess, the question. It's uh, kind of these uh, one of these weird kind of artificial questions where you basically have people, they have some specific number. LLMs are actually generally not good at, at these questions because they have like very specific numbers. LLMs are not very good at math and the logic here gets a little convoluted. Usually the way that these questions are worded, they're like worded in kind of a confusing way as well. Uh, Charles number, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So if we look at the phi one base model, so the one that's only done the pre-training, it actually just creates a bunch of <laughs> uh, variables here or properties of some kind of class. So when you see this self dot, that's basically a Python class, and these are all properties of class, and it basically just seems to store all of these in there. Uh, phi1 small is I guess the fine-tuned phi1 but a small version of it and then phi1 is I guess the fine-tuned phi1 but the normal size. Um, so this actually gives you the like a little for loop here. I don't know if this is correct. Uh, 30, I haven't actually even read this question but both of these seem a little bit more similar. This is actually incorrect. You wouldn't ever see the import statement after initializing a list like that, so that's a little bit weird. Um, the indentation here is also a little bit weird. Generally, you don't get LLMs that indent stuff in a weird way like that. Maybe it's just an artifact. But, okay. We demonstrate here that fine-tuning on code exercises unexpectedly improves the model's ability to use external libraries such as Pygame and TKinter. Improves the model's ability to use external libraries. Even though our exercises do not contain these libraries. This suggests that our fine-tuning does not only improve the task we targeted, but also makes unrelated tasks easier to distill for pre-training. Uh, shows the distribution of package imports. So this is kind of cool. This is, in their data set, these are all the different Python packages that it uses. So obviously typing is gonna be a very common package, math, random, collections, date time, intertools, num. So all of these are built in. 
except for I think NumPy is the first one that isn't built in. So this is NumPy is technically an external package. So that one's the first one there. Uh, regex OS, those are also built in. Matplotlib, not built in, but very common. Time string, NLTK, PIL, fractions, blah blah blah, and you keep going down here all the way. SciPy. Is there any interesting ones here? GeoPy, threading. It's interesting that threading is this low, right? Threading is kind of dead though. I feel like this threading package is IMO dead. Everybody just uses the async stuff now. Spacey, XML, decimal, enchant, IO, text blob. The number of imports among 87, 879,000 exercises in the fine tuning. The plot is generated with the following prompt. I have a dictionary. First sort the dictionary using the value from largest to smallest. Then generate the pi bar par, pi plot bar plot. Set the font size to be seven, then rotate the axis. So, I mean, if this is the prompt, this is kind of a very well-written prompt. I mean, this basically reads like pseudocode. All you have to do is basically turn each of these sentences into code. So you don't do, have to do any kind of reasoning on the specific order. All it's doing is it's basically just executing this. When the user press space, set the y x axis. Okay, so phi1 base. See here it's creating these variables here. Picking a random integer for those. And I guess what they're trying to do with this pi game is they're trying to figure out how correct is it going to be with pi game, right? Does it can it figure out what the API for pi game is or is it going to basically just hallucinate a bunch of stuff that doesn't work? So, do you guys feel like here, let's do this. If we copy paste this, let's select that and then copy it. And let's put it into our uh Visual Studio Code, right? Uh, while true, this needs to get indented. Uh, we need to get rid of this. Okay, put that there, that's fine. Uh, move these forward. I just want to see if uh, Copilot ends up with the same solution. If I don't actually know. I'm not going to like actually check this, but move that, move this, put this. All right. So what Copilot decided to say is pygame.display.flip. If we go to the paper, it's pygame.display.update. Oh shit. Look at this pygame.display.flip is exactly what uh, the base phi1 model decided to output. So that's kind of interesting, right? That uh, copilot also picks that same function. What does this actually do? Pygame display flip. Pygame.display with we control in here for flip. Update the full display surface to the screen. So it's kind of like an update content of the display, but it should have been display.update. Is that in there? Update portions of the screen. This function is like an optimized version of display.flip. Okay, so that's kind of interesting where the base model uses flip, but the uh, fine tune model uses dot update which is an optimized version of flip I don't know I don't know how much better that is would love to see how good fine-tuning with an interpreter in RL would make this model yeah I think that's another that's another uh, huge potential area for research Nisio that's a that's a really good idea is don't just uh, make the make the learning process interactive right so rather than just having a bunch of textbooks and the and it basically gets trained on this next token prediction task do maybe do something where it trains next token prediction on a textbook and then it has maybe a, a kind of a then it gets put into an environment where it generates its own examples and then has an interpreter and uses rl to generate the next 
textbook, right? So it's almost like it, similar to how when you go to school, there's like a phase where you're reading and then a phase where you're actually implementing and doing problems. So maybe you could see something similar in pre-training language models where you have a textbook and then uh, you have some kind of like RL phase where it does its own examples and it kind of pushes gradients that are based on kind of its capability on specific examples within an interpreter and then it goes back to textbook. So I just feel like there's so much more uh, ideas and things that people could be doing when it comes to the curriculum and the kind of uh, pre-training and training and fine-tuning uh, schedule for these LLMs. I feel like there's still kind of a lot left on the table there. Uh, is Copilot free or do you have to pay for it? I think I think it's free. I'm not sure. Um, there's a free one. I think you can... Uh, I think it's called CodeGen. Yeah, there's some there's some free ones. I think this one's free. But the 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 reason people use uh, Copilot is not necessarily because it's the best. The reason people use it a lot is because it's very convenient. It's because it's like built in to uh to to VS Code, which is really the most popular IDE. So if if Copilot wasn't built into to, uh, to the IDE that everybody uses, then I feel like it wouldn't be used as much, but the popularity comes from the ease of use and the access. Uh, okay. Bounces a ball, phi one correctly apprise the game functions to update and draw the ball. Uh, phi one base and phi one small produce function calls that are syntactically correct, but semantically irrelevant. Shows some ability to use the appropriate API calls, but it fails to follow the logic does not have enough capacity to learn the function calls. Okay. Uh, so this is going to be the same thing, but with TK enter. Okay, I'm, I'm not even going to read this, but I'm going to assume it's basically the same as the previous one. The model's completion show a huge gap in the prop understanding. Both phi1 base fail to understand the correct TK enter APIs. This is something that we ran into all the time. So uh, we've had coding streams on this channel, and in the coding streams, we... we uh, We'll ask ChatGPT and Bard, uh, for example, how to use pullers, right? Which is kind of like a pandas alternative. And both, and actually, ChatGPT is worse at figuring out pullers API than uh, Bard, right? So, correctly using APIs, especially APIs that like change over time, right? Most most uh, Python APIs are not static. They actually kind of change over time as people add new functionality and they change functionality, right? Like matplotlib, numpy, these things are constantly changing. Polars, they're kind of constantly changing. They're adding new things, deprecating things. So that makes it very difficult for these LLMs to learn and, and use these APIs correctly is because they're, they're changing over time. So like sometimes they train on uh, API calls that are actually outdated. Uh, okay. Uh, we finally show that Phi1 is a better chat capability than Phi1 base, despite the chat is exclusive in pre-training, but not in fine tuning. Okay, so here they're saying that Phi1 is uh, capable of extrapolating. It's capable of generalizing beyond the training distribution. The training distribution is, of course, code. And then here they're basically uh, treating it like a chatbot, and it's able to uh, transfer. Set the DPI parameter, use the rotate function. So I guess this is basically nonsense. And this is the actual way to do it. Yeah, you see here how it's telling you to use the set rotation function, but I don't even think that's a correct function. I think this is the correct function, axe.rotate. Uh, a potential concern with the surprisingly good performance of Phi1 on human eval is that there might be memorization stemming from contamination of code exercises dataset. Yeah, this is a huge problem, Is and I think this was behind uh, some of the controversy over some of these benchmarks. So the problem with, for example, here, this Falcon B40 instruct is that these benchmarks are available, right? You could go and 
download this truthful QA dataset, and then fine tune your LLM on that, and it would perform way better than if it hadn't seen that, right? So it's it's already seen the truthful QA. And when you're talking about the future of AI, right? And Saudi Arabia wanting to compete on the world stage, right? The, we're talking, this is like geopolitical at this point, right? So getting to the top of this leaderboard is not just about money. It's not just about companies and monies and venture capital anymore. It's, it's, it's geopolitical. It ha, it's, it's a national security thing. So do you trust the, the people working in Saudi Arabia to, to exclude truthful QA from the training data set? Or do you feel like they're getting pressured to, to get the best possible score on these benchmarks? So they're just taking every single one of these benchmarks and putting it into the training data set to get the highest possible score. I think the second, I think the latter is actually probably more common. And I think that when you get these type of uh, models that are trained by uh, other countries and, and groups in those other countries that are heavily incentivized to get a very high score on these benchmarks, I think that they're probably putting the train. They're probably putting these benchmarks in the training data set. They're probably not even telling you about it either. So this is part of the problem is that I think that because these benchmarks are public and you can just go and just scrape this entire benchmark and then put it into your training data set. I feel like a lot of these scores are actually bullshit. And I feel like I don't trust some of these scores because I don't trust that these people aren't pressured enough to put the benchmarks directly in the training data set. Uh, is it from UAE, not Saudi Arabia? Okay, my bad. I don't, is UAE versus Saudi, is that not the same thing? Am I ignorant? Saudi Arabia? Okay, so this is, I thought they were like right next to each other. UAE. Okay, so UAE is kind of like the city-state of Dubai, and then Saudi Arabia is Riyadh, and then Qatar is like this little piece here. Yeah. So it's basically, it's 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 like city-states is basically what I'm seeing. Is the, This is the city-state of Dubai, this is the city-state of Doha, and then this is the city-state of Riyadh. If we actually look at the geography, yeah, I bet you this is just all desert, so this is mostly trash, and then really the cities are here where the water is. Look at that, look at all these islands. <laughs> what the fuck is this? Well, that just doesn't look good. <laughs> I feel like they could have made it cleaner looking. Okay. Dubai AL. Yeah, do you trust the people in UAE to not put the, uh, not putting the benchmark in the training data set? I don't know. We studied this potential contamination directly while this section addresses the concern with new evaluation that is designed to be unconventional enough to be unlikely to appear in any training data set. Yeah, I feel like it's not, you have to almost make it secret, you know? To minimize bias and leakage, the new evaluation problems were created by a dedicated team in our group that did not access the code exercises data set or the final model. Yeah, you, you basically, it's almost like you need the double, double blind placebo controlled trial equivalent for machine learning, right? Where not even the doctor that is administering the pills knows which pills are real and which pills are fake, right? That's the, the concept behind double blind is that the person who is getting the pill doesn't know but also the person who is giving the person the pill doesn't know. So I think you need the same kind of thing for uh, machine learning, where it's like you can't just have these benchmarks just outside, just sitting there for so much to take and then fine tune their model on because there's just too much money to be made and too many kind of, uh, too much pressure to create these very strong performing models or what appear to be strong performing models. Uh, here's an example of such a problem. Sort, concat, square, deduplicate. List one, list two, my threshold. Okay, so this is kind of an example where given the name of the function and the doc string, can you write the function? But I feel like they could have added types here, right? I feel like if they added input types to each of these arguments and then an output type, I feel like that would have been a little bit more useful. 
Uh, one of the challenges of evaluating language models on coding tasks is that the output of the model is often binary. Either the code passes all the unit tests or it fails. I think that's a that's a good thing, you know, the fact that you can test it in an automated way. Uh, however, this does not capture the nuances of the model's performance as it might have produced a code that is almost correct but has a minor error or a code that is completely wrong but quote, incidentally passes some tests. Arguably, a more informative way of assessing the model's coding skill is to compare its output with a correct solution and grade it based on how well it matches the expected logic. Maybe, I don't know, I feel like you gotta give the LLM flexibility to find a better solution. Uh, this is similar to how humans are evaluated on coding interviews, <laughs> where the interviewer does not only run the code, but also examines the reasoning and the quality of the solution. I guess. To evaluate candidate solutions, we therefore adopt the approach of using GPT-4 to grade the solution. This is also starting to get controversial, too, because people are starting to realize that maybe GPT-4 isn't the most uh, unbiased grader, you know? Uh... Score, human eval, total amount of training tokens, the size. So here they're basically showing you how the model size trained on a smaller amount of tokens compared to, for example, StarCoder and CodeGen. I think we actually reviewed StarCoder on this paper or on this channel. So we should have a live stream for that one as well if you're interested. But this seems to be, look at that, 10 times bigger, over 10 times more training tokens. And it actually has a worse score. Yeah, actually, now I remember. I remember that. I, I think I. it was either StarCoder or CodeGen, but one of these two, we actually ended up using it and trying it out, and it was trash. It, it was actually outputting, like, syntactically incorrect Python, which is fucking crazy. It was like putting semicolons in the Python code, which is weird. GPT-4 is clearly the oracle sent from the heavens to judge all the robots. Uh, by using GPT-4 as a grader, we can leverage its knowledge and generative abilities to obtain a more fine-grained and meaningful signal of the student model's coding capabilities, and it obviates the need for tests. I, I just don't know, because here's, here's another thing to think about, is that the way that you're evaluating someone's code as a human, it's you're examining the reasoning and the quality of the solution, right? But GPT-4 probably is doing other things that we don't even realize. GPT-4 is probably looking at like the specific ordering of the words, right? So GPT-4 has, it might be human-like in its intelligence, but it's also superhuman in its ability to like kind of predict next tokens, which means that it has some fundamental notion of like the ordering of words in a sentence that we don't even understand, right? So like GPT-4 might look at a solution and it says, oh, you call this variable my threshold instead of my underscore threshold underscore int, that's a huge negative, right? So I think that something that people might not be paying attention to is that GPT-4 might be grading the solution based on weird, like, word ordering and word choice and, like, weird things that we don't even realize it's doing, but, but GPT-4 understands because GPT-4 is, like, very, very good at, like, next token prediction. So it has, like, this kind of, like, superhuman ability of like, you should use the word entries here. You should use uh, squares, but uh, actually you want to put this part of the sentence here. And if you don't put the, this part of the sentence here, that's an automatic fail, right? So, I don't know. I think that we have to be careful with uh, AIs judging the quality of other AIs. Uh, okay. Uh, the grades on our new unconventional problem give the same ranking as human eval. Phi Wanda Chen again achieves a score significantly higher than star coder as it did on human eval. Blah, blah, blah. Data pruning for unbiased evaluation. Uh, we see that training on code exercises leads to a substantial boost in performance of the model on the human eval benchmark. To investigate this boost, we propose to tune or prune. So pruning here is coming from, this is an English word that means uh, whenever you have like trees and you like go and you'll cut uh, branches off of them so that they can kind of grow better, right? So that's what pruning comes from. It it's basically means trimming or like cutting, uh, in this case, a data set. Uh, this process can be viewed as strong form of data decontamination. <laughs> I just need this on like a, like, like, like a, like a label. I want to go to a conference and wear like a little name tag that says data decontamination expert. <laughs> Uh, we retrain our model on prune data and still observe strong performance on human eval. 
Even after aggressively pruning for more than 40% of the code exercises dataset, the retained Phi 1 still outperforms StarCoder. So look at that. So even when they cut the pre-training dataset by 40%, it still outperforms StarCoder. We believe that such data pruning experiment is a fair way to evaluate performance and is more insightful than standard contamination studies in the literature that are usually based on measures of overlap between training and test data. For the sake of completeness, this section conducting a standard contamination experiment, which shows that code exercises is not contaminated by human eval. Uh, Ngram measures similarity of text segments based on their shared n-word sequences. We calculate the n-gram overlap between the doc strings of each human eval question and each exercise in the code exercise data set that was generated. Okay, so basically they're going to feed every single example in this data set into this uh, similarity measure. So you've heard of cosine similarity, you've heard of uh, Frechet sure inception distance, right? All of these are basically just distance metrics and n-gram, you can think of it as the same thing. It's basically just telling you how similar are these two pieces of text. So they run that and then they say, okay, well, how many of the things in code exercise are actually super similar to the eval data set, right? You don't want any leak between your training and your testing. The entire data set is contaminated if it's all Python. Yeah, <laughs> you can also think of it that way, right? Uh, we found four human eval questions. After further investigating, we found that all four overlaps are false positive. So uh, false positives means that uh, you detected something, but it wasn't actually what you wanted. Right, so false negative means that you should have detected something, but you didn't. Uh, and then false positive means that you detected something, but you shouldn't have. Uh, okay. You are given non-empty list of positive integers. Return the greatest integer that is greater than zero and has frequency greater than or equal to the value of the integer itself. Okay, so this is a specific uh, evaluation. So the example in the test data set, and this is the example in the uh, training data set, and they basically, with based on this n-gram similarity, they said that these two are very, very similar. But I don't know if I, I think that it might not be necessarily the Yeah, because I feel like this is different enough from this. So I guess I don't know exactly what they're trying to show with this, but I guess they're trying to show that even though the answer is correct for both of these, the actual prompt is not, right? The prompt here is very different from here. So you can almost think of this as uh, kind of like data augmentation, right? Where in when you're doing supervised learning in the vision world and for computer vision, usually you have a picture of a cat and then you'll use data augmentation to maybe flip the picture of a cat left and right and the answer is the same. So given that same picture of the cat just flipped left and right, you should produce the same output, which is classifying it as a cat. So this is kind of the same thing here where these two pieces of text result in the same answer, but they're different inputs. Uh, we now turn to the pruning. As we saw, the n-gram analysis is not refined enough to find similar code snippets between human eval and code exercises. Instead, we use a combination of embedding and syntax-based distances. Okay, so ngram is not good enough, and instead they're going to use uh, embedding distance. So they're going to do an L2 distance. L2 just basically means you take every single part of that embedding, right? Your embedding is just a vector of numbers. So you're going to take every element of that vector of numbers and subtract it from every corresponding element in that vector of numbers, and then you're going to square the difference, and that's L2 distance. L1 distance means you don't square the difference. L2 distance means you square the difference. Uh, okay, and the way that this embedding, the embedding is basically the last layer of this code gen mono 350 million model. Uh, embedding distance is successful in capturing code pairs where the overall code semantics are similar. Uh, for the syntax-based distance, we calculate the string edit distance between the abstract syntax trees of two given code snippets. That just doesn't feel like it's going to be as good. The AST successfully identifies overlapping sections between code pairs while being agnostic to non-syntax, such as variable function naming components and Python doc strings. I think this is actually what, so if you guys have taken uh, computer science classes in college, usually there's kind of like you submit your homework and it's automatically graded, right? And they, whenever they automatically grade it, they check to make sure that you're not copying other people's code. 
And of course, people copy code all the time, so they copy it and then they change the names of the variables. But I think the distance, the syntax distance in eight and these abstract syntax trees is actually what they use in most of these college courses to determine if you just copied your friend's code and then just changed the spacing and the name of the variables. Uh, for our pruning of code exercises, we fix a threshold for the embedding distance and then set several match rate tau for the AST distance. Uh, captured with the embedding distance, we vary t between 0 0.95 and 0 0.8. Okay, so basically different amounts of filtering. So here they're showing you uh, with a very high threshold versus a very low threshold, right? So if you have a very high threshold for similarity, it means you're not going to be pruning your data set as much, which means the final performance of your data set is going to be higher versus here, I guess it's... I don't know what they're trying to show us here. So this is similar, non-similar, and total. So if you have a high threshold, you're going to have less that are similar. If you have a lower threshold, you're going to have more that are similar. Percentage of similar versus non-similar correctly solved by different models. Similarity is determined on whether or not the corresponding human eval has close matches inside the code exercises dataset. I don't know. I guess the only thing that I'm really seeing here is that Phi 1 is better than Star Coder. Right? 48, 47, 62. Uh, versus the original Phi 1. We divide the human eval into two subsets. We report the accuracy of the models. As one can see, after heavily pruning our data set, Phi 1 still outperforms. Star Coder prompted. I, th I think, I think Star Coder is already dead. You didn't need to beat it up anymore. You know, Star Coder is pretty pretty crap. Is I guess what we're learning, <laughs> which we already knew. Um, conclusion: Just as comprehensive, well-crafted textbook can provide a student with the necessary knowledge to master a new subject, our work demonstrates the remarkable impact of high-quality data in honing a language model's proficiency in code generation tasks. By crafting or synthetically generating textbook quality data, we are able to train a model that surpasses almost all open, mo open source models on coding benchmarks. Despite being 10 times smaller and 100x smaller in dataset size, we hypothesize that such high quality data dramatically improves the learning efficiency of language models for code and as they provide clear, self-contained, instructive, and balanced examples. There remains a number of limitations to our model. First. Uh, specialized in Python coding. Yeah, maybe all of this is just coming from the fact that you're fine-tuning it on Python. So it's going to be better at Python. Uh, lacks the domain-specific knowledge with specific APIs. And due to the structured nature of the data set, Py1 is less robust to stylistic variations or errors in the prompt. None of these limitations seem fundamental, and with more work, our approach could be used to tackle each one of them. We also believe that significant gains could be achieved by using GPT-4 to generate synthetic data instead of GPT-3.5. Able to achieve such high coding proficiency despite the fact that it's using GPT-3.5. More generally, let's see where are we at? Uh, more generally, our work provides evidence that developing good methodology for creating high quality data sets is a central direction of research and advancing natural language processing. However, creating high quality data sets is not trivial and imposes several challenges that need to be addressed. One challenge is that the data set covers all the relevant concepts and content that the model wants to learn. Another challenge is to ensure that the data set is truly diverse and non-repetitive so that the model does not simply overfit to the data or memorize specific patterns. Finding ways to inject randomness, we need domain randomization, but for text, uh, while still maintaining the quality and the coherence of the examples. So this is something that uh, domain randomization uh, synthetic data. Yeah, so this is something that's very popular in uh, 
the space where I came from, right? Uh, synthetic data for computer vision, where basically you can, because of the way that game engines work, this is the best example of it. Uh, here's a robot and it's looking at a table with blocks. You can change the texture of all the different objects. And so you can basically do a type of data augmentation where the semantic uh, content of this picture is the same because it's the same shapes on the same table, but the visual appearance of this picture is different, right? Because now you have different colors, different lighting, kind of different angle maybe. So this type of uh, domain randomization that people do in uh, image-based synthetic data generation, there's probably an analogous uh, type of domain randomization that you could do for text, right? Maybe you take all your examples and then you basically replace uh, words with similar words, right? And that'll give you kind of a way to do data augmentation or domain randomization in the text space. Uh, presume they were going to use a linter or some code analysis tool for pre-processing. Yeah, I mean, that's another interesting question is, do you want all the examples to be linted or not, right? Do you want examples where the spacing is kind of weird and incorrect or do you want all of the examples to have perfect like pep 8 style lint i don't know uh if we have a data set with coding exercises it is hard to determine how many different variations of each exercise exist and how they are distributed across the data set finally as language models themselves will be used to curate data for future language models it further increases the urgency on the ethical and social implications of training such models, such as accountability, the transparency, the bias of the data, and the models that are involved in the process. I don't know about that. You know, fuck the AI regulators. All they want is money. They're just greedy. They want control and power and money. They don't actually give a shit about safety. Additional examples. Uh, for the example below challenging to the prevalence of various logical operators good paper surprising results goes against the intuition i had for large generation being better uh it's not it, think of it as it's like going with the intuition because they're generating the data set from an already bigger model right so it's like they take a small model and then they pre-train it on a data set generated by a big model the big model is just a compressed form of the original big model data set so yeah, I think I think more data is better, but more is just a generic word, right? And the, there's a quality metric there too. It's not just more data, it's more quality data or Yeah, I think I think I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how to say this. I feel like English is not good enough to convey these concepts, but I could see uh synthetic data for natural language and LLM pre-training becoming like a whole field, especially because people are going to want LLMs that have kind of a specific flavor or specific behavior. You know, I bet you the people here in uh, UAE and Dubai, I bet you they are very picky about what they want their LLM to say and not say, you know, so I can imagine that if you want LLMs that are approved for the people who work in or who live in Abu Dhabi and Dubai, uh, you're probably going to be training them on a different textbook than the one that you use for uh, a different uh, country, right? So I think these kind of like textbooks for pre-training that are aligned to specific types of humans and specific countries are going to be uh, a thing for sure. Fine-tuning improves the model's ability. This is kind of a similar situation that we were saying before. Here's your... <laughs> Uh, SVD decomposition here. Interesting how the Phi 1 chooses to use. So if you are using just normal Python, I feel like this is actually the way that you want your variables to be named because in Python you want lowercase variables like this. But here it actually chose to name them in a different style. This is more what you would see in math. So in the actual SVD math equations the u is capitalized so there's this kind of tension here between do you do you use the capitalization for that python kind of recommends or do you use the capitalization that is standard in math even though it goes against uh what you would do in python Okay, so that's kind of a little interesting tug of war there on the formatting uh code by phi one reveals a lack of understanding 
it uses NP Linalg SVD, which is incompatible with PyTorch tensors. Yeah, I mean, but this isn't fair, right? So the it's using NP Linalg SVD, but if you look at the X that is coming in here, the X isn't typed. So if you if you had a type here that said X is a PyTorch tensor, I'm sure it would not use this, and I'm sure it would not use the NumPy one. So I feel like you have to put the types in the function definition if you want to expect the uh, LLM to pick the right function, right? So I don't know. I don't know if that's fair to to say that it failed on that. <laughs> Completely clueless and produces a sequence of meaningless definitions. Uh, final API is a pyplot application limitation of phi one. Sensitivity to prompt variations. Sensitive to various perturbations of the prompt. This is something we saw with the RWKV model as well, where it's very sensitive to prompts, uh, prompt engineering. So maybe this is just kind of a property of small models where the, the local minima that they found, the compressing of their of the data distribution that they've settled into is fragile, right? Versus if you have a very big model trained on a bigger data set, the, the compression that it's found, right, the the local minima that it's found is a little bit more deep, so it's able to kind of have more consistent behavior despite the uh, differences in the prompt. So if you have more layers this issue arises because our exercises predominantly consist of short prompts. So if all your exercises are the same kind of length, it's going to have a hard time generalizing outside of that, I guess. So you see they create a neural networking class in PyTorch with three layers and then they basically change it to four layers and then that causes it to fail. It doesn't even... <laughs> It's it misspells fourth, is isn't it? F O U, R T H. Why why is it spelling it with an O? Fourth layer, is that actually how it is? Fourth versus fourth. Fourth and fourth are often confused because they have the same pronunciation, but different meaning. Fourth is an adverb that means forward. Yeah, it's kind of weird. Why did, why is it misspelled? Uh, okay, here you have, so this is actually incorrect. You do want to import, or you do want to inherit from this neural network module module uh, class here. And this is more interesting because uh, this is using Torch. So normally when you import uh, Torch, depending on how you import it, the uh, way that you ha define this class is going to be different, right? So if you're saying import torch as blank, or if you're saying from torch import nn. So interesting how they have a different convention there. Most of this seems the same. This is using the functional API. This is also, this doesn't have ReLUs either. I think uh, what, what you want here is lazy linear is actually how you get the ReLUs without having to explicitly have them in like this one does. And then this one is just straight up nonsense, like cell.forward doesn't mean anything. <laughs> Sensitivity to natural language inputs demonstrates less robustness in handling natural language compared to GPT or star coder. Uh, Alice is moving a point along the x-y axis. Each time she moves the point, x increases by 2, y decreases by 5. x stays unchanged. Wait, I see something. Okay. Uh, little for loop here. This actually 
doesn't even define the variable n, so right off the bat you have an error there, right? You need to define the variable. This one doesn't, this, these two just kind of give you the number. Random.choice. Ooh, this one looks fucking weird. Analysis final position. Yeah, so maybe here what's what's happening here is that X and Y is a 2D movement. So here, like technically there should be a movement in Y and a movement in X. So actually this is actually more correct here because this here is giving it a tuple. Yeah, the model hallucinates the moves one, two, and three, zero. Oh, I see, because the moves themselves are a specific repertoire of moves. So this is actually correct. But this thing just starts thinking that one and these are actually uh, X, Y moves. This is kind of a weird little edge case here. Bad at counting and spatial reasoning. Okay. Examples, okay. AST match rate. Embedding distance, so these code exercises. All right, I think we've pretty much gotten to the end here. Um, Where are we at? 148, all right, whatever. That's pretty quick, you know, it's fine. It can be quick. Uh, okay, let's do a little summary of the paper here, and then we'll end it there. So today we read uh, Textbooks Are All You Need, which is coming out of Microsoft Research. Uh, so this paper proposed uh, and showed evidence for the idea of heavily curating and, and synthetically generating data sets for both pre-training and fine-tuning. Uh, so... The interest they they narrow uh, they did show significant uh, performance right so they had a small model that was trained for less on a smaller data set and it performed better on these uh, coding benchmarks but it's also only on coding right so all of the paper results which are pretty good right they showed pretty good performance for a smaller model and trained on less stuff but it's only on code. So it's still yet to be determined whether this uh, synthetic LLM uh, pre-training and fine-tuning data will work for things beyond that, right? Does this work for medical data? Does this work for law lawyer type stuff? Does this work for um, chatbots, right? Do, does a chatbot trained on synthetically generated chatbot data, is it better at chatting? Is it a better chatbot? I don't know, we don't know yet, right? So. But I think to me, this opens up the door, right? To me, this kind of shows a very strong data point that says, hey, we should probably be looking at synthetically generating uh, these kind of what they call textbooks, but they're basically these small compressed kind of data sets that are very, very clean and very, very uh, thoughtfully created for the purpose of uh, not just pre-training, but also fine-tuning a model. I think the fine-tuning one is actually going to be more important. I think that pre-training you'll probably just see people using as much data as they possibly can but this idea of a textbook of a synthetically generated data set for the purpose of fine tuning i feel like that's that's really where the where i would keep digging uh so yeah pretty cool little paper um lots of examples you know kind of a little bit short i wish they would have done more experiments i wish they would have done more a broader kind of focus, maybe try different programming languages, see how it compares, see if it loses its ability to work on other programming languages, right? I think maybe the tasks were a little bit too narrow. They fine tuned it on Python and then they tested on Python. Like I would have seen, I would have liked to seen fine tuned on Python and then tested on Rust or some other language, right? Like does it, does it lose some of its ability to generalize whenever you fine tune it on this synthetic data set or does it just get better overall, right? I think there's a, more questions they could have answered but i think this puts us in an interesting place where people are probably going to start doing research on this if they're not already doing research on this uh 
so yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Uh, cheeky title check, yeah. Uh, so I do have news for the channel as well. I will post on Discord, but I'm probably not going to be streaming next week. I have some real life stuff that's going to prevent me from uh, streaming, but. I will come back a week later. Uh, I'll update you guys on Discord and, and Twitter and so on, but this is probably my last stream for uh, at least a week. So thank you for listening. Hope this was useful. Drop by the Discord. Come chat with us. Like and subscribe. And see you guys later. Have a great weekend.